at the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. Let me set this up for us by going back for a second to the third chapter. In the third chapter, we find this very familiar account of Peter and John going into the temple. And their attention is grabbed by a man who's sitting on the floor. He's sitting there because he can't get up. He's crippled. And he wants them to give him some money so that he can eat for the day. And Peter utters that famous answer to him. He says, I don't have any silver and gold to give you, but what I do have, I give in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And the man did. He was healed instantly. The scripture tells us that he walked in the temple, leaping and praising. So much for being crippled, right? And he gave praises to God because of it. Well, fast forward to the next chapter, chapter 4, where we will spend a few more minutes. And what has happened is that wonderful, good, kind, generous deed that Peter and John did in giving that man his legs back. What is that old saying about no good deed goes unrewarded? Uh, in this case, it's no good deed goes unpunished because the rulers of the temple, the Jewish leaders, the elders, have Peter and John arrested. And they're in trouble for this good deed that they did. So we go to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to investigate that. They got in trouble because they were a bold witness for Jesus Christ. That's really the topic of what we want to investigate this morning. Pray with me for just a second. Lord, we ask that in these moments as we consider your word, what happened to your servants, about how they became such bold witnesses as to turn the world upside down. Lord, we ask that the meditations of our hearts, the words of our mouths, might be found acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and redeemer, O God, King of glory. Pray. Amen. Whenever I look at the history of a church, and this church is no different, but whenever I look back over the history of a church that stood for Christ for many years, I'm intensely interested in the why and the how. Why has some church stood and others have just faded off the scene? And how? How in the world did they do that? And I'm always looking for the signs that are always extant in strong churches that are healthy. And those signs, I believe, can be summed up in the one phrase that we're going to investigate this morning, bold witness. A bold witness for Christ. That's why and that's how a church stands for many years. And as I said, I don't think this church is any exception. You started in a brush arbor. But a bold witness touched this community, this church has been here more than 175 years. When a church is an organization, as opposed to an organism, an organization is man-made, and it will pass off the scene, it will wither and die eventually, like any other man-made thing. But when a church is a sold out for Christ's body, it will grow, and it will thrive, and it will stand as a beacon of the gospel. That only lasts, however, as long as the church keeps that mission of being a bold witness for Christ on the front burner. So the question that we want to look at this morning is this. How can the church, how can any believer, be a bold witness for Christ? Now I want to give you eight reasons. There's eight slots on that little sheet that is in your bulletin this morning. And it will give you something of a hint, but it also gives you the scriptures that I'm going to read. We're using the New Living Translation this morning. Being a bold witness gives life to a church. And we'll look at the ancient church, the beginnings, beginnings of the church, where Peter and John are incarcerated and they're in trouble for having faith in Christ and being a bold witness for Christ by healing a man who had been crippled for all those years. The first reason that they were a bold witness or became bold witnesses is because they had faith in God alone. Look at verse 4 with me. Many of the people who heard their message believed it. 
So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. That word believe shows up in that sentence twice. And to believe in the biblical sense and the language of the Bible is to trust in something, is to rely on something, is to cling to something. These people who followed Christ took God at His word that He would save them. He, they trusted in Him. They relied on that. They clung to that truth. They believed. The gospel message of Christ birthed faith in the hearts of those who heard the witness of the disciples. Genuine faith, real faith, I'm not talking about hope so faith, I'm talking about genuine faith, knows no such thing as crippling fear. This was the beginning of persecution that resulted in incredible growth. The persecution by the Roman government was supposed to stamp out the church. That was like trying to put out a grease fire by pouring water on it. Have you ever done something as dumb as that? When Elizabeth and I were first married, we moved into our first tiny little apartment and the little uh, postage stamp sized kitchen that we had. Uh, how many of you remember fondue pots? Great thing, right? The oil was bubbling up and somebody left it unattended and some, something happened and it was a little fire that started. Well, somebody, I won't tell you which one of us did, but he threw... <laughs> he threw water on that thing and suddenly we had 911. Everything worked out. We're still here. That's only 50 some odd years later. But uh, the elders that ruled the Jewish temple tried to, uh, tried to stamp out this bunch of upstart Christians by persecuting them. But all it did was spread more courageous faith and growth. John Wesley had a statement about that that I want to read to you. Listen to this. He said, Give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Hmm. You know, when people have genuine faith, faith that is only in God, and when they'll do nothing more than just love people with a heart that wants to see heaven overflow with all the souls that can fit up there. I'll tell you what, witness becomes bold under conditions like that. Because faith requires sharing. But listen, the church that stops doing that, the church or the body of Christ represented as the church or a church member that will not share that faith will find that that Faith shrinks to nothing. What's the old saying? Use it or lose it. If you don't use that faith, if you don't share that faith, if you don't use it by sharing it, what will happen is it will shrink to nothing. And it will show up in your life. Your fellowship with other Christians will shrink. Your discipleship will shrink. Your stewardship will shrink. Everything shrinks if it's not used well. John Wesley's famous statement about spreading the gospel message, believe it, is iconic to Methodists. It's what we were known for back in the day when we really cared about winning souls. Listen, when you place your faith in a building or an organization or another human being, or even in yourself, as this culture that we're living in now seems to have perfected, that faith will wither, it will fade, it will disappear altogether. But simple unadulterated faith in Almighty God will move mountains. Mountains. A second reason the disciples' witness was bold was that they were filled with the Spirit. Notice with me verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak. Many people are afraid of the very idea of being Spirit-filled. But it's really strange to me that anybody would feel that way. Anybody who has accepted Christ as Savior would feel that way. Because... Perhaps it's because of the excessive dwelling on this by some groups. But listen, friendship with God means that His presence is going to dwell with you. He's going to dwell in you. And it's not so much that God takes over your life against your will. Being filled with the Spirit is much more about surrendering your life. It's not how much of the Spirit you can get inside of you and then use it and control it. Rather, it's how much of you does the Spirit control 
How much of you does the Spirit have access to? How much of you have you opened to the Spirit? If you want your witness to be bold for Christ, give Him complete control of your life. The Scripture says, Be ye filled with the Spirit. And then a third reason that the witness of the disciples became very bold was because they dwelt in nothing but truth. Nothing but truth. Verse 10. You remember the situation here. The, the elders are reading the riot act to Peter and John. And what happens is John answers them back. And he says, let me clearly state to all of you. Did you see that word clearly? Let me clearly state. He might as well have said, let me, let me tell you the truth here. He said, let me say this to you and to all of the people of Israel, that the man who was healed was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man he crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. you hear all the truth in that? That's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? You crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. Guess what? He's coming again. And that's truth as well. Peter's response to the Pharisee's question was so different than just a few weeks prior when he had lied. He had sworn three times he didn't even know Jesus. He just wanted to save his own hide. Peter's weak faith now had become strong and it just couldn't be silent any longer. Nothing but the truth. The whole truth then. Nothing but the truth. Another reason why the witness of the disciples in that day became very bold was because they learned to be exclusive in an inclusive culture. Hello? How many times a week do you hear the word inclusivity or inclusive? If you go to work anywhere these days, there's in inclusive training, there's sensitivity training. But the disciples were not so. There was not an inclusiveness. Well, there was surely an inclusiveness when it came to the idea of the gospel is for everybody. You know, I preach the word everywhere. Tell everybody about Jesus. Don't hold it back. But they were exclusive in another way. They believed that there was an exclusive way to salvation. Listen to what John said here in verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. Folks, that is as exclusive as you can get. Salvation in no one else. What's the rest of that? God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now, this is a deal breaker for a lot of people, including a lot of Methodists, frankly. But Peter's flat statement, no other name, means just what it sounds like. There is no power to save us from our sins in Allah. There is no power to save us from our sins in Krishna or Buddha or any other group denying the triune oneness of the Almighty God, Father, Holy Spirit, and Son. <coughs> Salvation does not come from political programs in Washington, D.C. It does not come from educating our children beyond their ability. It doesn't come from math geniuses or social engineers or cloning Albert Einstein. Salvation is only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's an exceedingly politically incorrect statement in a culture that wants everything valued equally and accepted without question. Your friends... How in the world can we value, as believers who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, how can we value empty-headedness that winds up in hell? To be a bold witness for Jesus Christ means you settle in your heart and mind that Christ alone can take people to heaven. You do remember when Lazarus died. Jesus finally showed up and he found Mary and Martha weeping over their brother dying. Oh Lord, if he'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, he'll rise again. And Martha said, sure, he'll rise in the resurrection. Jesus looked her square in the eyes and he said, I am the resurrection. Those are familiar words. I am. Where have we heard that before? Oh yeah, Moses in the burning bush. The voice that talked to him out of that burning bush said, I am that I am. What does it mean, I am? You 
original language of the New Testament, it's ego and me, meaning it is I and no one else. It's an intensive. It's definite. It's exclusionary. It includes no one else. Friends, if you miss this, at this point, we have no witness, bold or otherwise. Jesus and Jesus only is Lord. Inclusiveness may get you a gold star from Washington or kudos on Facebook, but heaven will be shedding tears over your apostasy. A bold witness for Christ is a Christ-only witness. Number five, the disciples learned that if they were going to depend on anything, they had to depend only on God. Look at verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness appear in John, for they could see that they were ordinary men. How many of you are ordinary? Let me see your hands out there. Come on. Are you ordinary people? The rest of you are super. These people were ordinary men. These were no great big scholars here. And it says that they had no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Peter and John's bold witness before the Jewish council should be our evangelism methodology. Our way to tell the entire world about Jesus. What is the methodology? What happened to them? They did some good stuff for a guy that really needed it. Secondly, they got in trouble for it, as you always will, if you do good stuff for people that need it. And then thirdly, when they were arrested, they had a perfect platform to tell the truth to everybody. Somehow, doing good stuff would put you in that position. The key to the Pharisees' amazement was because the disciples had spent three and a half years with Jesus. They didn't need seminary training. They didn't need other human guides. They had God covering every part of their bodies. And sticking with the gospel as our mission, like the disciples did, will confound the so-called wise. It will stymie and silence the powerful. Christ's work done in Christ's way will be its own validation. It will be a bold witness. And then number six, we need to learn like the disciples to refuse to be silent. You know the community in the world wants us to be silent. You know Christians take a bad rap for being uh, angry, hateful people. I want to tell you something. I, I, I don't see that. I see, a, I see a few nut jobs out there. I mean, there are some people that do some things in the name of Christ that they have no clue who Christ is. But listen, most of the Christians that I've ever known are wonderful people. They're joyful people. They're happy people. They're, they're people who want to see others go to heaven with them. What's wrong with that? We need to refuse to be silent like Peter and John. Look at verse 20. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? He said, We can't stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. Pharisees and Sadducees had issued a threat. Don't you dare talk about that, Jesus. You keep them locked in a box somewhere. Don't even mention his name. But Peter asked them this question in return. Do you think God wants us to obey you? rather than in. Are you more important than God? And what did they tell them? I'm going to give you the Greek translation of what Peter and John actually said to these guys. He said, hang it on your ears, man. We're not going to back off telling people about Jesus. Hang it on your ear. We can't not obey Christ even if we were frightened to death of you. Christ had called them and made them bold witnesses. There was no turning back. What did John Wesley say about it? It doesn't make a difference whether it's clergymen or laymen. Both sides of the pew and pope are here. Give me a hundred men who will love Christ like that and refuse to be silent. He said, we'll turn the world upside down and set up the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. These believers may not have been pedigreed with college or seminary degrees, but whenever something was going on, they knew it was time to drop, drop to their knees and to put it all on the line with prayers delivered to the throne. It tells us in this text, in this uh, chapter, Acts chapter 4, that uh, this courageous move by Peter was one thing, but what was behind it, what fueled all of it? It was the church praying for Peter and John as they spoke out, as they refused to be silent. 
Peter's faith had grown by tremendous leaps and bounds in the few weeks since he denied he even knew Jesus. He put that faith to the test with a kind of holiness and boldness that only a fool or a man possessing great faith can muster. And when faith marries bold courage, Christ is always honored. And Christ, in turn, will always vindicate righteous faith. Hallelujah. Let your faith in Christ make you a bold witness, even in the face of threats. I've got two more, and then we're going to go eat lunch. You are invited, by the way. The disciples learned that if they were going to be bold witnesses, they had to be ready to deny self, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. So, ready to deny self. Verse 29 and following, And now, O Lord, this is the church praying, now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. <coughs> hear the threats of these, these rulers, these guys who are religious leaders who are in the temple and have control over your house, God. Hear their threats against us for preaching about your son who died for us and then rose for us and is coming again for us. Hear their threats and give us, they don't pray for political power, they don't pray for the kind of strength or wealth that you hear about on some TV evangelists? What did they pray for? Give us great boldness in preaching your word. God, give us the kind of thing that's going to get us in trouble time and time again. What does it say in the Scripture here? After this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with what? What would happen right now? We bow in prayer. We say, God, give us great boldness. And then suddenly this whole building began to rock back and forth. What would you think? Oh, man, I've got to talk to the trustees about this. <laughs> could it be that God sometimes answers us by shaking the place, turning the world upside down? When the rest of the disciples heard what had happened to Peter and John, they took right to prayer. They prayed for boldness. The place shook with the Spirit's approval. And then they did the very thing that Peter and John had asked for and what they did and what they were beaten for and prison for. They preached Jesus boldly. I'll tell you, once again, the key to the disciples' faith was a lifestyle of prayer and unity in the church. Some people misunderstand that concept of unity as you got to be really nice to each other. That's not unity, folks. That's conformity. The church exists for the purpose of worshiping God and telling others about Jesus. It's not a matter of whether we will just get along and not offend anybody else. It's a reality that we are called to be the people of God who proclaim the message in spite of our differences. Let me tell you something. If we took a poll here and had six or seven or ten or however many test questions, I guarantee you that there would be 50 different answers to question number one, 75 different answers to question number two. The point is we have differences. It's not a question of all thinking exactly alike, all thinking the same thing, all saying the same words, dressing the same way, parting what hair we have the same way. It is a matter of being the cooperating church that proclaims the message. Listen, you can have all the love feasts you want with being nice and patting each other on the back, but listen, if you don't even try to win your community to Christ, you do well to call yourself a Lions Club or Rotary Club. The church is all about being a bold witness for the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, these people, these disciples, Peter and John, they are the, twelve, the rest of the twelve and all of the disciples that, that uh, put their life on the line and most of them lost their life for Christ were confident of the resurrection. They had a confidence that just would not end. That confidence in the resurrection, they staked their life on it. They relied on it. They clung to it. They believed in it. Notice verse 33. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And what happened? God's great blessing was upon them all. Now listen. Peter, the apostle who denied the faith 
he, or he denied Jesus altogether, but he denied faith in Christ out of the cold darkness outside of Pilate's house while Jesus was being unfairly beaten and tried and illegally convicted by a kangaroo court. Peter more than turned all of that around. He became such a bold witness to proclaim Christ that it got him in trouble over and over again until finally Peter was, according to church tradition, crucified just like Jesus. But he didn't want it to be just like Jesus. He didn't count himself to be uh, as worthy as Jesus. And so when it came time for Peter to be nailed to the cross that he was nailed to, he begged his accusers, he begged his executioner, don't hang me right side up on the cross, turn me upside down. I'm not worthy to even be in the same room with Jesus. These early believers and many to follow throughout history, they took heart and they served their Lord. And that's what the testimony of this chapter of those disciples calls us to do in the tumult of our days. I want to revisit something with you that I told this congregation last November. Last November, we were in a season of prayer for the upcoming vote at General Conference of the United Methodist Church. You had to have been living on Mars not to hear something about it, at least. If you attend a Methodist church, you probably heard more than you ever wanted to hear about it. But we were anticipating the vote over whether we were going to be a biblical people or whether we were going to be a culturally acceptable people. I told this congregation and its sister congregation, Pleasant Hill over in Seagrove, I told us that we have the choice we have the responsibility to take heart that Christ is in our heart and He will not abandon us. And so I asked us two questions. I said these are important questions. The first, not as important as the second. But the first question was this. What's going to happen after the vote? What's it going to look like in the United Methodist Church? Who are we going to be? Who's the community going to think we are? What's going to happen after the vote? Then he asked a question that I call much more important than that. What will you do after the vote? What will you do? And I offered three possible solutions, three possibilities of what we might do. I said, first of all, we can take our ball and go home. We can let this church fall apart on its foundations. Say, I'm done with it. I'm done with all of it. You know, some people have done that. Secondly, we could sit and wait for the wave of the powerful to just overwhelm what's left of this denomination until they kill it all together and just shake our heads. Oh, you tell told you what's going to happen. Oh. And thirdly, I said, we can take heart and we can serve the Lord with gladness. There's a great illustration of this in a movie and I shared this at that time as well. The movie was Shawshank Redemption. Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman are two friends in prison. They're serving life sentences for murder. Tim Robbins is named Andy Dufresne in the movie, and Morgan Freeman is Red Redding. Andy and Red bond over a period of 20 years that the film covers. Now, the warden is an evil guy, while the two prisoners act with common decency towards everybody. At every turn, the warden attempts to do what he can to beat down all the prisoners, breaking their spirits. And the ordeal nearly robs Andy of all hope. But in the final few minutes of the movie, he turns to his friend Red, and he says this. He says, I guess it all comes down to a simple, small choice. You either have to get busy living or get busy dying. In February, our delegates to the General Conference took a bold witness step. They stood on the side of biblical marriage. They stood on the side of biblical sexual relationships. That, my friends, is exactly what the fourth chapter of Acts describes for me. This was a bold witness step. They got busy living a bold witness. That's what our delegates did. 
If I had the right as a pastor to commission you in your next step as a church, here's what I would say. Get busy living. Be a bold witness. With bold faith and unending courage. Take heart. And take responsibility. And serve the Lord in this community with gladness. Serve Him with a bold witness for Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say Amen. Amen. Our